Welcome back to um, our Senior Leaders Town Hall. We're really excited to see all of you here. Again, we wouldn't be able to do these forums without our wonderful sponsor. And today, I'd like to welcome to the stage um, our wounded, uh, the Wounded Warrior Project. We are honored to bring um, up on the stage Army Le retired Lieutenant General Lennington. General Lennington serves as the Chief Executive Officer of Wounded Warrior Project. He brings 35 years of military experience and leadership to the organization. Thanks, Patty. And let me once again thank everybody and especially thank AUSA for allowing Wounded Warrior Project to again sponsor Family Forum 3. This is a really important event this afternoon and it's especially important to hear from the three Army leaders I feel uh, are passionate and committed about Army families and how Army families play a, play a big part in, uh, in Army readiness. And I will tell you, uh, just as uh, Army families are a priority for the Army, uh, caring for families of our wounded, ill, and injured service members is also a priority of Wounded Warrior Project, and it's an area that we've placed additional resources and effort this last year as we hope to help families of our sick, ill, and injured that are transitioned into civilian life. As I watch our Army continue to successfully answer our nation's call, not just overseas, but uh, here in the States as well, I couldn't be more proud of all that our Army is doing, both our uniformed military our civilian, uh, civilians and our families that support them. Uh, over the last many years, they have done amazing things for our nation, and I proudly wear my Soldier for Life pin as a 35-year soldier in the United States Army. Uh, I want to especially thank those uh, in the Army that have responded to the recent hurricanes that affected um, Texas, Florida, uh, the state that I now call home, uh, Puerto Rico, and the Caribbean. Wounded Warrior Project has 772 wounded, ill, or injured service members and their families in Puerto Rico, and the, and the support of the Army on the island is really making a huge impact in helping them get back on their feet. So thank you for the Army for doing that. I'd also like to take a moment to congratulate the AUSA Volunteer Family of the Year sitting in the front table right here. I just met them in the green room. They are an amazing family. You'll hear more about them in a little bit, and I will tell you they're, they're charming, they're passionate, and they really are an inspiration to all of us. Uh, Wounded Warrior Project believes, as our Army does, that family readiness is indeed military readiness. In that regard, as we care for our Wounded Warriors, families, and caregivers, please, for the commanders, the family support groups in the, uh, in the audience this afternoon, and Command Sergeant Majors, and those responsible, for U.S. Army families, please use us as a resource to help our ill, injured, and wounded uh, service members and their families, active, guard, and reserve. Thanks again. Thanks for USA for the opportunity to be here today, and let's get it on. Thank you so much, Mike. At this time, I'd like to ask the audience to please stand as we welcome the Army senior leaders to the stage. How's everybody doing? Oh, up. I think it's okay to clap. Next, I'd like to introduce Lieutenant General Gwen Bingham, the Assistant Chief of Staff for Installation Management Command. Excuse, installation Management. Lieutenant General Bingham is the Principal Advisor to Army Senior Leaders on Installation Policy Plans and Resources, which includes the important soldier and family readiness portfolio. Installations, whether a fort, camp, depot, armory, or reserve center, support the readiness of active duty National Guard and Army Reserve soldiers and their families. Ma'am, thank you so much for agreeing to be the moderator. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And so before we begin, I want to first thank AUSA and recognize Ms. Patty Barron for all of her hard work to make these military family forums a reality. They provide us a great opportunity to discuss important issues facing our soldiers, civilians, retirees, and families. 
Thank you for being a great partner at USA and advocating for Army families. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. And so it's my great honor today to be the moderator of this year's AUSA Town Hall with our Army senior leaders. Today you will hear about our number one priority, which is readiness. Families of our soldiers make sacrifices for the nation that contribute to Army readiness and play an important part in achieving mission success. The Army is committed to providing the care, support, and services necessary to enable self-reliance and to ensure a ready Army. Today, we will hear from our Acting Secretary of the Army, the Honorable Wine McCarthy. Secretary McCarthy is a former Army Ranger. He is a soldier for life. After five years of Army service, he understands the sacrifices and challenges our soldiers and families make. Secretary McCarthy would say he is most proud of his wife, Jennifer, and his daughter, Alexandra, who unfortunately could not join us today. Clearly, the importance of family is never far from his mind. Sir, thank you for joining us today. Let's give him a round of applause. Our 39th Chief of Staff of the Army, General Mark Milley, is also here to share his insights for a strong and ready total force, inclusive of our soldiers, civilians, and families. And Chief, I want to thank you for your wonderful and inspiring remarks today at the luncheon. You're welcome. <laughs> I also want to recognize his wife, Ms. Holly Ann Milley, who works in tandem. Yes, give her a round of applause. Who? Ms. Holly Ann works in tandem with General Milley on family readiness. General Milley and Holly Ann, thank you both for joining us this afternoon. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> and lastly, our 15th Sergeant Major of the Army, SMA Daniel Daly, will provide his perspective on soldier and family support and ensuring readiness across the Army. We are fortunate to have both the SMA and his wife, Holly Daly, who are in their third year as part of the Army Senior Leadership Team. Together, they work tirelessly to improve the quality of life for all Army families and champion the issues and concerns of the all-volunteer force. SMA Daly and Holly, thank you both for joining us this afternoon. All right. So now it's time for some questions from the audience. Hey, yo, wait a second, Gwen. Yes, Chief. Uh, I want to make a comment about Daly. All right, you Can are I welcome. I'll yield the So board. has everybody read the Army Times? <laughs> so I personally think Sergeant Major Daly is the finest Sergeant Major of the Army ever. Uh, I propose that he be made Sergeant Major of the Army for life and that we rename <laughs> the Army Times the Daily Times. <laughs> here, here. Uh, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Nay. The motion is passed. Uh, that's it, brother. You're it. Uh, how about, Sergeant Major, if you can make a couple of opening comments, I'll, I'll, I'll make a couple of brief remarks, and then uh, Secretary McCarthy will make a couple of brief remarks. Is that okay, Gwen? And then we'll go yes, right please. into question and answer. Perfect. I'd like to start off by saying that. He didn't know I was going to do that, so. <laughs> Neither did our, I. No, uh, that's okay. Our chief is a gracious commander. Uh, that's why I'm not a commander. <laughs> Thank you, sir. But, Mr. Secretary, um, Chief, Ma'am, and, uh, and to the audience, uh, first of all, it's an absolute uh, privilege and honor to be up here and to talk to you as your Sergeant Major of the Army. Um, one of the primary responsibilities given to me by the Chief of Staff and the Secretary of the Army um, is to travel around the Army and gain a sense of where our morale is uh, with regards to our soldiers and our families and their support programs. And in doing that, I, I usually do town halls at every major installation I go to, and I get very direct feedback, very direct feedback in many cases, which is good, um, from family members and soldiers. And I'd like to share uh, some of that perspective with you and uh, just talk about a few of the things that I think we're doing quite well and then some of the challenges that I think we still need to pay closer attention to as we move in the future. Everyone is quite familiar with the complex environment that we've lived under in the last few years and the complexities of the resource constraints that we've been under. But I would tell you the same statement I would like to open with you today is the same one I open with our soldiers and families across our Army. We take better care of our soldiers and families than anybody else in the world. Bar none. Ooh.
Now, with that, we're not perfect, um, and we can always get better. And we are an institution that is very scrutinized of itself, and we should be. Um, and there's some things that we have to do. But uh, as I travel around, I'd like to tell you what I get a sense of when I talk to our family members before I talk about specific issues. And I'm pretty proud of the fact, as a matter of fact, that we, we have built a sense of resiliency like no other in our families over the last 16 years of war. They have done incredible things with a limited amount of resources and capabilities, and they have bonded together um, on installations, camps, and stations across our Army uh, to make things happen and support our soldiers in their warfighting mission. Uh, they have, um, I get a sense that they believe that things are going to get better in the future. They have hopes in the civilian leadership of this great nation, as well as our military leadership, that we're going to continue to provide them with the necessary resources, provide them a level of care commensurate to that of their service of their soldier. And, uh, and they believe in that, and they trust in us. But we have to keep that trust with our families. It's something that I reiterate when I testify each year, is that a, a break in that bond and trust of the future could cause significant degradation in the morale of our families and our soldiers. And I think that to this day, though, we have maintained that trust as an institution, uh, both uh, as a nation and our Army. But there are things that we can get better at. And the top three things that family members talk to me about all the time, first and foremost, is child care. We've put an incredible amount of resources, and we've made this a top priority the Chief of Staff has under our Total Army Family Program. But we have to get better at things like background screening for our um, care <coughs> providers. We got to give them um, amount of time so it's commensurate with employment. People can't wait around, and we're working that very hard. And the chief and the secretary have uh, given our background screening people the necessary resources to make that mission happen. We need to make sure that we continue to invest in our infrastructure. Uh, we've uh, had limited resources that we had to apply to, understandably, readiness first. But in the future, if we don't continue to put uh, the necessary funding within our uh, infrastructure, the world-class facilities that we built for our soldiers and families over the last 16 years of war um, will begin to feel the, t the test of time. Um, and we need to continue, lastly, to alarm me strong. Families understand the, the fiscal restraints that we are under. They do truly understand that we have to make very tough choices when it comes to putting the right rifle in our soldiers' hands or continue to sustain certain family programs. And uh, they truly do believe that we're doing what's in the best interest of them, and that's taking care of our soldiers first. But Total Army Strong is the policy that gives commanders at installation levels the authority to make the decisions to, to uh, fund the programs that are necessary for those families in that geographic area of location. And they truly understand that they have a voice with their commanders. And I would like to just close by saying that over the last few years, we have been in a very tough environment, extremely tough. And then we have to make some serious risk decisions. And I was asked by um, a, a member of Congress the other day of where we're assuming risk. And I said, well, I'm not the chief and I'm not the secretary, but we're assuming risk everywhere. And it's very tough. And they understand that risk. But I can tell you, I just want to give uh, a, um, a public, public acknowledgement to all the hard work that IMCOM and Axiom have done to maintain the care of our soldiers the amount of things that we've given them to do and the amount of resources we've given them to do under any circumstance would have been impossible, but they pulled it off. So let's give them a big round of applause for their hard work. So my bottom line assessment that I often give to the Chief and Secretary after I visit installations is we're okay. We're not broken. We're not bent. We're okay. There's things that we can improve. If we continue to listen to our families and continue to support Total Army Strong, and we continue to fight for the necessary resources we need to have a way of life for our soldiers and family commensurate to winning on the battlefield, then we'll be just fine for the future. Ladies and gentlemen, I look forward to your questions. Thanks, Sergeant Major. Appreciate that. Uh, first, uh, it's a great privilege and honor to be up here in the uh, third year in a row now. And um, as everyone in this room knows, when, when uh, I became chief, we, I, I threw out three priorities. Priority one is combat readiness of force, and that's what, what people would expect. And, and the second is the combat readiness of the future force, otherwise known as modernization. But the, the third is not really the third priority. It is a constant priority, and that is to take care of soldiers and families. And there's uh, reasons for that uh, that are directly related to readiness. Uh, our desire to take care of families and soldiers is not just because we love Army families, which we do. Uh, it is directly related to readiness. And why is that? It's because um, all people that are relatively normal, that are, uh, you know, a family, 
Uh, their top priority, believe it or not, and this may come as a shock, their top priority for a, a spouse, like my wife's top priority, is actually not me. Um, her <laughs> top priority is her children. Uh, and uh, the top priority of any spouse is going to be uh, the children of the family. That's kind of number one. For a soldier, about 60% or so, actually a little bit higher than that, of our army today uh, is married compared to World War II when 10% of our army was married. Uh, on average, uh, they are a family of four uh, with two children in the family. Uh, so that's a fundamentally different demographic than we had, say, during World War II. <clears throat> so what does that mean? That fact means that we have to elevate uh, taking care of soldiers and their families to a very high uh, order uh, in our resource prioritization uh, in order to maintain readiness. Why is that? Because a soldier, we want the soldier to focus on the shoot, move, communicate, protect, and sustain tasks that are necessary, the fundamentals that are necessary for combat readiness. That soldier will not be able to focus and devote the time necessary to those skills if they are worried that their child doesn't have adequate medical care, that they're in a lousy school, uh, that their house has mold, uh, the house is leaking, uh, it's an unsafe uh, environment uh, for their child, that there is no child care, that the spouse doesn't have uh, employment, that the cost of child care is too excessive, and a whole host of other reasons. If there are overwhelming needs and concerns at home, then that soldier will become a much less ready soldier. Uh, so the reason uh, that this is such an important priority, the reason the three of us are standing here before you today is because we hold this as a very critical element of the overall readiness of the Army. Um, and just to prove it, how much important our children are to us, I would just ask my wife to go ahead and turn on your text message because your son just texted me. That would be our son, not, not her son. I do take partial responsibility for his birth. So uh, he just texted me and he just said, would you please have mom look at my text? So I said, okay. So I said, I kid you not, I kid you not, I'll have, I'll have the Daily Times verify my message uh, right there. There we go. So right there it says it. So could you just check, please? Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, so, <laughs> So, but seriously, you know, I'm not trying to make light of it. That is, that is really uh, fundamental to soldiers' readiness, is the welfare of their family. And that's why we hold it in such high regard. And on that note, we have uh, the Army's uh, Family of the Year. Uh, and I'd like to give a quick round of applause to Seidel family. We're yeah. coming in from Germany. And <laughs> and they, uh, they uh, have won that uh, uh, honor uh, in representing all the families of the great uh, army that we have and the great families that we have. So thank you for your service to the nation. Thank you for your continued service in retirement over there in Germany at the CMTC and, and what you do and your entire family does. So thank you very much uh, again. And I also want to recognize uh, two folks, Amy Moore and uh, Jennifer Laredo. I don't know if you're out here. Are you out here? Amy, Jennifer? One over there. Stand Please. up, stand up, stand okay. up. Okay. Uh, they're members of uh, the SOG, the Survivors Advisory Working Group that works uh, thanks. Uh, how about a round of applause? She. <laughs> now, Amy and Jennifer are, are moving on, uh, but they have rendered great service uh, for all of the survivors, the Gold Star families uh, for which they represent. It's a small group, uh, half a dozen or a dozen or so folks that meet with me and the Secretary and Sergeant Major and others uh, periodically, uh, typically uh, semi annual, the annual basis. Uh, they bring in to us all the issues of the extended family of the survivors of those soldiers that uh, have given their lives uh, in the service of their country. Uh, it's an incredibly uh, powerful, small group uh, that represents all those survivors uh, throughout the country and indeed throughout the world. Uh, so thanks for your service uh, to that group and thanks for your service to Army families uh, forever. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to the uh, Secretary of the Army, but let me say one thing. I don't know how many folks were at the Eisenhower lunch, but. Uh, let me take a moment here to introduce Secretary McCarthy. He's been on the job for a little bit of time, but he's actually been on the job all his life. Uh, this is a guy that I've known uh, since we first crossed paths about a decade ago. Uh, and he went to the Virginia Military Institute, graduated, commissioned in the infantry, uh, served in the Ranger Regiment as a young officer, uh, served in combat on multiple tours. Uh, so he's seen the elephant up close, so to speak, in the early years of the war. 
Uh, after that, he got out, uh, served up on Capitol Hill as a staffer, uh, then came over to the Department of Defense, where he served uh, almost every single day uh, next to Secretary of Defense uh, Gates, almost every single day of Secretary Gates' uh, tenure there. Uh, and he learned a tremendous amount uh, at the strategic uh, level. In addition to that, he, he had then went out to industry uh, for a short period of time, uh, and then he answered the call back to the callers here uh, a, a few months ago to get uh, nominated and now confirmed as the uh, acting Secretary of the Army, but the Under Secretary of the Army. So this is a man of great integrity that I've known and admired for a long time. Uh, he's a man of drive and energy, uh, and he's going to serve all of the Army, not only the in uniform, but all the Army families uh, in an extraordinary way in the, in the many years to come. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Secretary McCarthy, but thank you for your service. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Chief. Thanks, Chief. I appreciate that. I, uh, this is a tough job uh, for under any circumstances, but when you get to do it with someone that you know for a long time and you trust with your life and your family, all that you have, it makes it that much easier. And uh, General Milley is just that to me. And it's been a, a, an interesting 68 days, but we try to have some fun, although it can be very stressful at times. You can't surge relationships, and as the Chief mentioned, we've known each other for quite a while. Uh, so uh, it's great to be here with you, Chief and Sergeant Major. I know we're spending a lot of time together, and it'll get better over time, but uh, I've learned a lot from you in a very short 68 days. Um, before I make uh, some remarks, I want to make a mention to the, the Seidel family. You're an inspiration to me to be a better father and a better man, and uh, it's really an honor to meet all of you, and congratulations as the family of the year. Thank you. Yeah. As I mentioned, I've been on the job for a very short period of time, and my singular focus has been in large measure to how do we build a budget that has the rest resources and authorities that we need to support the force. That is my principal responsibility as confirmed to be the Undersecretary of the Army or the Chief Management Officer, but I'm serving in an acting capacity now. And if you have anybody you talk to that works in the Army staff, this is where my singular focus has been. Times are very difficult. A lot of this is outside of our control to get sustainable, sufficient, predictable funding for over almost a six, seven year period has been a challenge. So at times when you get these mechanisms called continuing resolutions, we have a very unpredictable environment. It creates churn and complexity and affects families. For that, I don't want to make an excuse. We'll do what we must. But in large measure, it's my job to make the compelling case first to my boss, Secretary Mattis, and then ultimately with the Congress to get the resources we need for the Army. And you have my vow to do that for every day that I'm in office. That is my single fo uh, pro uh, for, uh, focus as I proceed. I'm here today to listen and to learn and to inevitably to act. This is the greatest honor of my life to serve in this position, and I'm honored to serve with all of you. So thank you very much. All right, Gwen, we're ready for your questions, but just in case anyone's wondering, I have reserved the right for lifelines. Uh, so I have uh, Katie Dahl, you're out there. Go ahead and get a haircut, son. So he's right out there uh, somewhere. Where's Katie? I'm sorry. Where are you at? There you are, right over there, sorry. Uh, we got a few doctors and nurses in the room, so any medical questions will be deflected to them. Uh, we do have the G1 of the Army, so Tommy Siemens, will you have to identify yourself right now? Thank you. Okay, so another lifeline. Mike Lennington, you're out there. Just as an old friend, we might deflect to you on occasion. Uh, so for any other more difficult questions, oh, Chaplain Hurley, where you at? You're from the Holy Land of Boston. Unfortunately, our Red Sox went down the tubes last night. We're going to go with the Cubs. We're going to go with the Cubs now. So, uh, hua, Cubs, they're bon. Uh, Chaplain Hurley's out there, so you may get called upon as well. And may God be with you. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's go, Gwen. All right. Fire away. Okay. So it's time for questions and answers. And if you have a question for, for one of our senior leaders, please raise your hand and a staff member will approach you with a microphone. I will call upon you one at a time and, stand and, a and ask you to stand and ask your question. I only ask that you please be concise with your questions so that we can address as many topics as possible. We also have staff in the back of the room that are monitoring the Facebook live streaming webcast for questions from our viewers. Those questions will be printed and brought to me. So let's get started, shall we? First question. 
There are no questions. That's the end. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is coming from Facebook. Great. When soldiers are discharged due to being suicidal from PTSD, then their families should know. Help make families aware of PTSD and give our soldiers the treatment needed. How do we make sure the treatment that is available to them is known so we can stop soldier suicides? Yeah. You go first. And that's a great question. Um, and we've worked very hard. Uh, the chief and the secretary have given us the necessary resources to embed um, behavioral health all the way down to the unit level. And this is the first key. Um, first key in this is breaking the stigma. And I think we've done phenomenal work at that. As a matter of fact, the current soldier survey says that we're getting better at it every single day. Um, they see senior leaders going to seek help, and they see our, uh, their peer soldiers going to seek help. Um, but the key is, is that now we have gotten very good at this. Every single time we go to a major deployment or a field exercise or any time there's injury, there's an automatic uh, requirement for the soldier to seek behavioral health. It's part of our in-processing screening and it's part of our out-processing screening. And we just got to educate our young men and women that need, they need to ask for help when they need it. Probably the biggest point of intervention that we need to break the ice on with regards to suicide is peer intervention. Um, in many cases, when we have a suicide across the force, someone else saw the indications but failed to do something about it. And I'd ask, that that's one of the things we have to work on as leaders across our Army, um, from our civilians to our soldiers to our family members, is that peer intervention is the key. Many times these individuals are suffering from very traumatic um, experiences or very traumatic illnesses, and they need peer intervention. And you, we've all heard some of the cases where a, when a peer intervened, they changed the life path of an individual who thought they were going to commit suicide. So I would say is that peer intervention and seeking our help that we have available today as we continue those efforts, I think that we'll continue to make uh, strides with the, the serious issue of suicide. So, Gwen, this is a long, this has been an issue now for the Army for quite some time. We, we, we uh, have studied it <clears throat> intensively. Uh, and, and I don't claim and I don't think any of us would, and probably nobody in this room claim to be uh, an absolute expert. Uh, but there are some things we do know. Uh, first thing we all should acknowledge, uh, no matter who you are and uh, no matter where you come from, um, uh, the first thing to think about is there but for the grace of God go I. Uh, the human psyche is very fragile, and any one of us, any human being, under the right combination of stress can break. Uh, so the stigma piece the Sergeant Major uh, is talking about is really important. There should be no stigma uh, to any sort of mental health illness or any kind of uh, sorts of depression. Uh, people struggle, uh, ups and downs every day, some within the bounds of normalcy, some uh, go outside the bounds of normalcy. Sometimes there are external factors which uh, create uh, in e extreme and intense stress. Uh, we know, scientifically, we know uh, that the brain is uh, a, a mass of chemicals and, 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 and uh, tissue matter uh, that if uh, uh, struck with the hard blows, overpressure from, uh, from explosions uh, or from firing munitions, uh, we know that if you're in a traffic accident, we know football, playing contact sports, uh, boxing, there's all kinds of numbers of external uh, things that can physically impact the brain and fundamentally change the chemical composition uh, of your brain. We also know that uh, a wide variety of stress, not necessarily physical, but does have physical effects. Uh, and if they're in the right combination at the right time, that can fundamentally alter uh, the chemical makeup of the brain that can then create a wide variety of either temporary or enduring and long-term mental health issues. Uh, and no one, and I mean no one, should hold any stigma about that because that can happen to any one of us at any time. I have personally seen it and many in this room have personally seen it uh, and we all need to reduce and eliminate that stigma. That's the first thing. Second thing uh, is the idea of what I would call diving catches, what, what Sergeant Major called intervention. In almost every suicide case that I have looked closely at over the years, and there's been a lot of them, uh, there's some sort of tipping point, some sort of crisis point that occurs typically uh, within, a, within about a 72 to 96 hour period of the actually consummating the act of suicide. Um, it's in that period, which is the crisis period, uh, which is usually there's something out there that someone 
uh, will observe, and they'll see it, uh, and they need to feel fully empowered to intervene. Uh, we have gone through a lot of training in the Army, uh, and we have young soldiers, privates and specialists, that are doing diving catches every day, every single day, with so other soldiers that have suicidal ideations. Uh, and so that, breaking down the stigmas and empowering people uh, to intervene is fundamental. Uh, the third thing I'd throw out there um, is that what you really want to do, obviously, is not have a suicide to begin with. So resiliency training, the ability to have the learned coping mechanisms, uh, and we have institutionalized that throughout the Army. There's a wide variety of programs that do that for our soldiers and is available to family members. That is fundamental in the prevention of suicides, uh, is to enhance and build up the ability of, uh, of, of the resilience ability of, of soldiers and family members uh, in order to deal with a wide variety uh, of stresses. Uh, we know that there are three, I know this sounds like you know, your grandmother talking here or something like that, there are three fundamental things that major league contribute to resiliency. One is good sleep, literally good sleep. I don't want to sound like you know, grandpa, but seven, eight hours sleep a night, it's unbelievable for mental health. Second, PT, daily PT, you don't have to be an Olympic athlete, but exercise an hour to two hours a day, unbelievable. And third is eat healthy. I know it sounds so simple, but all of the science has told us in all of the studying we have done, those three fundamental things will keep you balanced. That's important. When you see people who aren't eating, aren't doing PT, aren't sleeping, boom, red flags, time to intervene. Uh, so reduce the stigma, empower people to intervene, and learn resiliency and learning how to live a healthy, balanced lifestyle will go a long ways towards prevention. Those are programs that we've been uh, really, really emphasizing uh, throughout the Army for many years now, and I believe we're having uh, some success at it. Thank you. That's a performance triad. I'm just a spokesperson for MedCom for that. I want to get credit, but that's what the Chief just said. <laughs> performance triad. Where's the MedCom commander at? You're welcome, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, here's another question. TRICARE needs to be better. We have so many doctors who don't want to take our insurance. Can you please comment on this? Ms. Secretary? <laughs> well, no, I'm gonna, no, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna help the secretary here. I'm gonna divert. Where's, Thank you. Where, 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 where's uh, Najib? Uh, how about Ron? Ron Stevens, come yeah, on, lifeline. Yeah. Come on, Ranger. Step up to the plate, young man. There's a microphone right there, right next to you. There you go, it's like a reality show. Get up there. Okay, Ron Stevens uh, is a great uh, doctor. He has a, he has a large family himself, uh, and I've known him for many, many years since he was a young officer, and uh, I didn't know he got promoted. I probably would've stopped that if I knew that, but he got promoted. <laughs> no, seriously, Ron's a great man, and he's gonna answer that question, so go ahead, Ron. Thank Swing it to bat. Turn my back to you. Yes, you may. Okay. Yes. So first of all, ma'am, I, I need to call a party foul, because that's two medical questions in a row. We haven't had anything on schools, Care. That's right, quit your sniveling, just, just answer the wait. question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I'm Ron Stevens, I'm the Deputy Chief of Staff of Support for General West, and on behalf of her and Command Sergeant Major Director, I want to thank you for the question and the opportunity to respond. Uh, we're talking tough business here, and, and I mean, anybody that, uh, that watches the news or reads the papers knows that health care in the United States is under, under uh, un un times of uncertainty with the Affordable Care Act, with people replace repair, who knows where we're going to go. And, and so it's a constant it's a constant effort on the part of Army medicine or DOD medicine. I mean, so please keep in mind, TRICARE is not an Army program. It's a DOD program. And uh, Army medicine, along with our colleagues in the, in, with the other services and the Defense Health Agency and our colleagues in the, uh, with the, the contractors who provide the care on the outside, are constantly working hard to provide a high-quality product in the direct care system as well as in the purchase care system. And everybody knows that depending on where you're stationed, uh, the size of the facility that's caring for you, you're going to get variable care in the in the fixed in the military facility as opposed to in the civilian in the civilian facility. And those MTF commanders on the ground are working closely with their partners in the community to to to, to, to deliver the, what we call a benefit, a tri-care benefit. Um, and in terms of of the availability of the care, it's it's going to vary from from location to location depending on the on the. I mean, all health care is local. Like all politics are local, all, all health care is local. And so it's, it's a constant 
uh, effort on the part of those contractors that are responsible for delivering the care in the civilian community in coordination with the, um, the facility commander on the ground to provide the, the product that you need and at the time that you need it. And I can tell you without a doubt, Army Medicine is totally committed. I'll, I'll shamelessly say what you said, uh, Commander Sergeant, or Sergeant Major Daly. Um, we, we provide better care in the military health system than any other system in the world. I will stand by that. We have seven kids. Um, they all have gotten care. I, I missed one day of medical school. Now you know what it was. Um, <laughs> but um, all, all of us care in, in our facilities. And I w we, would go, we would go nowhere else. We would never have and never will. Uh, do we get it right every time? Absolutely not. Um, but uh, like Sergeant Major Daly said, we, we do well, but we can always do better. And when you're talking about access, when you're talking about safety, quality, uh, patient satisfaction, we're always in a constant effort to try to make that better. And the only way we're gonna do that is the feedback from our patients. Uh, let us know, and we, we believe me, we get, we get the feedback on when things don't go well, and we want that feedback because we wanna make things better. But you know what? We always also want your feedback on when things do go well, which frankly happens the vast, vast, vast majority of the time. And we need to tell our docs and nurses and medics and techs and everybody else what a great job they're doing. So please give us that feedback when things go well. Please give us that feedback when we can do things better so we can make the services better for you. Thank you. Okay. And Sergeant Major, I think you have. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I just wanted to tell you, too, I, I, along with General Bingham and myself, we represent the Army on the Military Family Readiness Council. And I can tell you that this is of utmost importance, not to just the leaders that are up here, but in the Department of Defense. And it's something they're working continuously. And I can tell you is that uh, our goal is to provide the world-class health care to our soldiers and families. And they're spread across a very diverse environment throughout the world. And that care has to be provided in hometowns in America across. a very difficult task. But it is in the utmost importance. It's one of the top priorities on the Military Family Readiness Council's list of agenda to get after. And I know that we have to uh, continue to push that. And the Department of Defense is uh, definitely behind the same issue. Okay, there's a question in the back of the room. <clears throat> you. I'm a veteran, a military spouse, and an Army civilian. At work, we often hear how important the civilian workforce is and how we contribute to the mission. And I'm very proud of the work that I do. My question is, can something be done in addition to spouse preference to make it easier when we PCS rather than losing our jobs and having to deal with the stress of unemployment? Can you repeat the second part of that? Yeah. I got you. Yes, sir. Which, which part? The second part. Um, my question is, can something be done in addition to spousal preference to make it easier when we PCS rather than losing our jobs and having to deal with the stress of unemployment? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, Sergeant Major said he wanted to take a shot at that. <laughs> I heard him say that. Yeah. Thank you, sir. So we have been working this. and There actually has been um, some things done. Now, I just want to manage expectations. Um, so spouse preference is very high on the preference. The things that are above that um, are veterans preference, disabled veterans preference, and some other things too that are understandably at the higher preference level. This is currently an ongoing initiative in the Military Family Readiness Council at the DOD. Um, we have a study going on on the things that we can do to increase spouse preference. Uh, but that's not where we should stop. Um, because that's just one avenue of the bigger problem. The bigger problem is spouse employment for our family members as we PCS around from station to station, camp and post. And, uh, and we, we need to solicit the help of everybody, not just the DOD or the Department of the Army, but industry, and we have. And the Military Spouse Coalition has created thousands of jobs. We have to educate our families on the great resources we have across our installations. And I know that we're not utilizing them appropriately because every single post I go to before I leave, I visit the Transition Assistance Center and the ACS. And one of the greatest underutilized resources we have is the Job Assistance Program. And we have dedicated professionals that say, Sergeant Major, if you just get them in the door, we have a bunch of people that want to hire our, our great spouses and family members. So we need to get the word out. One, it's about education. Two, it's about continuing to work the issues to the limit of our capabilities because we don't want to disadvantage one group by trying to advantage the other. But let's look beyond just spouse preference and let's take a look at some of the other resources we have internally to help our family members seek jobs as they PCS throughout the Army. And Diane Randon is out here somewhere. Diane, where are you at? There you are. So Diane is uh, one of our great civilian uh, assistant secretaries of the Army uh, for MRNA, for Manpower Reserve uh, Readiness uh, Affairs. And, um, 
And Dan, is there anything you want to add on civilian employment and spouse opportunities uh, when they PCS from post to post? Well, I do think there's a, um, so for the, the question, um, there's three different ways through spouse preference, veterans mm -hmm. preference, and of course being a DD civilian already. So um, among the three, there are different ways um, that you can have some kind of continuity, even for DA civilians, we can be put on leave without pay as we transition to a, a new destination, working with the command for some type of employment. Um, so I, there, are, there are tools in place, management tools in place that can be leveraged. And you know, there's, a, there's a laundry list of things, but my advice would be, you know, if you, if you are getting some pushback or you're getting a no, please just keep asking and, and bring your question in so that we can either work it through CPAC channels or bringing it into the building through G1 and MNRA so that um, depending on your status, we could address maybe what works best for you so that we have some type of continuity of employment. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Does that help answer your question, ma'am, back in the rear? Does that help out or? It, it does, sir, but the, the issue is sometimes we go to places. Um, I know ACS has jobs open, but sometimes they're not in the same skill set that we currently have. Um, and then the other issue is when we PCS to a location that maybe doesn't have a lot of government positions open and we have to take jobs that are either lower than where we've, we've worked towards or, and earned, or that there is leave without pay. I came to my current location on leave without pay, but it doesn't solve the unemployment issue. Okay. Um, we probably need to relook all that. Okay. Good. Thank. Thanks for bringing that up because that's probably a rock in our rucksack. We need to take a look at some of our policies on that one. Thank you. Microphone for Diane. <laughs> uh, so this is probably not going to get to your specific question. Um, and one of the unfortunate things that we've been trying to navigate through is civilian um, significant civilian reductions in our formation, and so we've gone through. Uh, depending on the command, 20% reductions, 25% reductions, over 30% reductions, and it is a challenge. Um, as we try to uh, use management tools, um, in fact, it was a good thing uh, that we got VSIP up to $40,000 because it's a management tool we can leverage as we're trying to right size uh, the number of folks that we have in our commands um, with the reduction of authorizations that we have. So it's a, it's a huge challenge. Um, and we recognize that, and I and I still go back to my original answer that you know I implore you as you're seeking to have employment with our army or um, in another uh, agency within the government where we could help you better that you bring your specific questions in because then we can address them in a individual way um, in some way that might might work best for you. But we do recognize it is a challenge as we've had significant reductions across the uh, DA staff. Our, our DA formation at large. Okay, go ahead, Gwen. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. This one has to do with the PCS process. Mm -hmm. Are you aware of the many issues our service members are experiencing during the PCS process? The system in place is at best not user friendly. The claims process is mm -hmm. also difficult to navigate. We all expect some damage during the moving process, but extreme damage, lost or stolen items should not be acceptable. What steps or actions could be taken in the future to make this process better? Hmm. Hmm. Can I answer? Well, uh, yeah, I'll have a chance, but um, I'd have to get the data. I've been in the Army, you know, a long time now, almost 40 years. Uh, and I've moved, I don't know how many times, but it's a boatload. And I have had damage as well. And yes, PCSing in the Army, the, the Army's this massive organization. There's this huge hierarchical bureaucracy, there's paperwork, and so on and so forth, right? So we all re recognize that, we all deal with it. And PCSing, the act of moving, whether you're civilian in the civilian commercial world or whether you're in the military, the act of moving is high stress. Uh, and, and that is one of the stressors uh, that can contribute to other things. Uh, so, and we move frequently. Um, and it is, I'll be candid, it's painful. I've never seen one that isn't. Uh, now, it's triply painful uh, for spouses because oftentimes the soldier moves ahead. Um, and my wife is living witness to moving the Millie family 
at least half a dozen times or more uh, completely by herself to include all the way across the Pacific Ocean uh, to Korea. Uh, and that was exciting. And I was in the doghouse for at least 12 months of that deployment uh, for that. So it is incredibly stressful. It is incredibly painful. <clears throat> and damage does get done. And it's a pan in the neck to go through the claiming process and so on. Um, I'll be candid. I don't have any magic solutions. I believe for the most part, if you were to look at you know, the batting averages sort of thing, uh, if you look at the actual data, uh, I think most military moves, vast majority of military moves, are done relatively smoothly uh, with you know, little or no damage to any material. Uh, that's not an excuse. It's, I'm not trying to make an excuse. Uh, it happens. It happens too much. One time is too many. Uh, and it needs to be properly addressed, and there are mechanisms in the system to do it. Uh, but I couldn't agree more with you. There, it is difficult. It is painful. It's bureaucratic, and things, when you get stuff broken, and we've had plenty of stuff broken over the years, when you get stuff broken or lost, um, it, it is painful to go through the claims process and get all that stuff done. I don't, I don't have a good answer. I guess I'm partially agreeing with you. Uh, but I also know that it's been out there for a long time. Uh, I will, here's what I'll do is I'll uh, personally uh, dig into that one. Uh, I'll let Sergeant Major say what he wants to say about this, but I'm going to personally dig into that one a little bit more because now for the first time in my life I actually have, I'm in a position where I might be able to impact something. Uh, even though it does, it's governed by joint travel regs and, and DOD rules, it's not really Army policies that are at play here. Uh, but let, let me and Secretary McCarthy dig into that a little bit more. Uh, there are probably some, a few things that we can do to improve that process. Sergeant Major. Yes, sir. Uh, th this is something that recently has come up. Um, the Secretary of Defense actually was somewhere and received uh, feedback from some soldier, sailors, and a Marine that they were having issues and concerns. Um, none that I, th I don't think anybody in this room that has been through several PCSs as the Chief Staff of the Army has said that they have incurred. Um, he has asked each of the senior list advisors um, to gather information on the issues and concerns. Some of those are the systemic problems, uh, problems that we talked about. I've already done some initial feedback from that. Um, and they really come down to the user level, the level items. One is the kind of service you receive and the individuals they're hiring to bring your goods to your home. Many of you all are shaking your heads and know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, the second one is, is the bureaucratic process of filing the claims, which usually deters you from doing it. And you just live with the scratch on the TV for the next three PCSs. My wife yells at the scratches we have all the time. She, yeah. Um, and then three is the, the lack of support at the installation level um, for someone to come out there and assist you with those claims or processes just from the sheer magnitude of what we move. I just could tell you having some initial meetings with Transcom, that's the agency that now has oversight for DOD for our, our PCS moves. Um, and as you could tell, the scale across DOD is, is quite enormous. Um, it's an industry problem too. There's not enough even industry even to be able to move us at the rate of which we need. And then the labor that wants to work in that field is very, very reduced. Um, so it's caused, but those are not excuses. Um, so we gotta get better at it. Um, so we are currently in that process of gathering the information. Um, like I said, we'll make sure that we give that to the Chief Staff of the Army and get it up to DOD so we can address our families' issues and concerns. But it is an issue of concern. Thank you. Hey, uh, Gwen, I know that you said one more question, but I got a couple of questions too. And I'd like to get some feedback. I mean, me and the Secretary don't do this very often. We don't have an opportunity to do it very often. The Secretary is new in the saddle, um, and, and frankly, we need a little bit of feedback here on the installation. So I'd like to get, if not questions, but comments uh, on uh, education, uh, because I, as I said up front, our children are fundamentally the most important things in all of our lives, and their education is, is critical. I'd like some feedback, if, if, you, if you don't mind, from some folks, some commentary on uh, the education that our children are, are getting, either in public schools or private schools in and around installations and or DOD schools if they happen to be overseas. Uh, is it good, is it bad, is it getting better, getting worse, uh, uh, major issues or anything like that. Uh, housing, uh, we put a lot of effort into housing. Uh, so uh, are there any particular things out there that we need to be looking at? Uh, sports, uh, sports is important in a lot of people's lives. Uh, and when our children move from school to school on a frequent basis, they oftentimes uh, don't get the same consideration uh, in the incoming of the new schools uh, varsity athletic programs or junior varsity athletic programs. Uh, and we did sign a compact, you know, with all the various states 
Uh, there's some standardized educational and sports rules that apply now across the United States. If there's any feedback on that. Uh, and then I'd be particularly interested, this is a total army, okay, so uh, we've only got 476,000 soldiers and family and soldiers in our regular army, but there's 1.2 million in the total army. Uh, and we fight as a total army. Uh, so I'd like to be particularly enlightened to any kind of issues concerning National Guard and Reserve. I know time is limited, Gwen, uh, but no one should feel restricted uh, to the time. You can get a hold of the Secretary of the Army, uh, Secretary McCarthy, you can get a hold of me, you can get a hold of the Sergeant Major. Anytime, day or night, 24-7, uh, we're always available. Uh, I will happily give out the Sergeant Major's phone number. 703-474-3197. Since 99% of the Army is enlisted, <laughs> that's the number to call. <laughs> Can you repeat that one more time, please? 703-474-3197. And uh, you can reach me. And, uh, I, and, I, just, and I, just, I just put my cell phone number on Facebook, sir. That, that's okay. That's excellent. Well done. <laughs> so uh, everyone will be calling you. That's good. And, and I encourage everyone to call Sergeant Major Daly. Uh, but, but Secretary McCarthy are an email away. So, and I'm, I'm, I know it's, I'm making light of it, but I'm not really making light of it. Secretary he's, McCarthy he's and I are, are an email away. <clears throat> and neither one of us can sprinkle magic dust and solve all the w world's problems. But we're both extraordinarily committed, mm -hmm. along with the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army, General McConville, and Sergeant Major Daly. Uh, and, but many times when you're at the levels we're at, we don't know what we don't know, uh, and we failed mind reading in high school. There's a lot of layers <clears throat> between us and ground truth. It's very, very important uh, to us personally. Uh, you know, we weren't born in these positions. We come up through the ranks uh, in, in each case, uh, but the organization is so large, there's a lot of times there's issues mm -hmm. out there that we won't see, and we want to help solve them. Sometimes those issues can be solved very, very quickly with a, with a secretary's phone call or a waiver or Chief of Staff of the Army does something, Sergeant Major of the Army does something. So don't hesitate. <clears throat> we are your Secretary. We are your Chief of Staff. We are your Sergeant Major. We are your leaders. Uh, we are not something on high. We're not just photographs uh, on, in the hallway on the way into the PX. We are your leaders. We are active. We want to solve problems. We are here to solve your problems. Uh, and we're deeply committed to it. So thank you very much. Here, here. So there is a question, Chief, in the back. Good afternoon, sir, Sergeant Major. Sergeant Major Aubrey from Fort Hood, Texas. And um, you mentioned about the education uh, piece and what kind. So I'm speaking on behalf of a few of my soldiers um, at Fort Hood. As you know, it's a very large post, so a lot of our soldiers' children have to go off post to the off post schools. And uh, they deal with uh, certain issues and um, making sure their children are treated fairly. So uh, I'll speak specifically to two incidents and all I ask is that the, um, if we could make the military school liaisons more visible, because neither one of these soldiers knew about a military school liaison. They're tucked off somewhere. I, I, we had to find ours and I know we have them and there's supposed to be a liaison mm -hmm. between, for us, between us and the schools to solicit that help. Um, it was a very difficult situation, and that person eventually provided some help, but, but uh, after the two soldiers went through a difficult situation. So if we can make them more visible okay, good. for our soldiers, that would help got us, it. sir. That's good sir feedback. Major. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much for that. Thank you, yes, sir. Over here. I'm a non-military person, but uh, that's it, okay. We love you anyway. It, it strikes me that the military services, uh, uh, General Milley, this is to your point, uh, are doing a much better job than our public schools today of raising good citizens or turning young people into good citizens. Could the military services, obviously the Army uh, and all the others as well, uh, handle uh, the mandatory uh, government service, let's say from age 18 to 19, some form of government service? Uh, yeah, no, you're talking about like the draft? No, he's talking about, yeah, I know what you're talking about. The, no, you're talking about public not service. Not drafts, oh. Something more akin to the Israeli. Yeah, yeah, mandatory service. public service, and you can, you have an, 
the high school student has an option to go into yeah. the military, or they can go into the Peace Corps, or they can go into Teach for America, those kinds of things. Um, I, I'll, I'll be candid uh, from a national security standpoint. At this point in time in our history, uh, we have the, the all-volunteer army, the all-volunteer military has been quite successful. Uh, and we have extraordinarily talented people that we've attracted into the military. Uh, we have extraordinarily talented people that are retained in the military. Um, and we, we uh, and I agree with you, we turn uh, citizens into soldiers and soldiers back into better citizens uh, when they get out. Uh, I would not personally right now, as the Chief of Staff of the Army and a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, I would not recommend uh, that we introduce, uh, reintroduce any kind of, we're, we're not in a period we're right this minute, we're not in a period where that's necessary. There could be a period of time where that becomes necessary from a national security standpoint, uh, but that is not the case of the condition that obtains today. There is, of course, value to that you know, across the country for a lot of reasons, as you cite, uh, and other countries do it for their own reasons, but uh, we don't. But one thing that we do for the Army, uh, and something that I think we should consider, um, is we have linkages into a wide variety of programs around the country in the junior ROTC, which is not, man, is not getting at exactly what you're talking about, but we have junior ROTC across the country. Now, that's actually a very good program, and in many communities, that's a very important program uh, for young men and women in the high school years uh, to learn uh, citizenship in the way that you're talking about. And we, the Army, uh, support that and sponsor it in many, many places, and some of them are very tough inner city neighborhoods and others are, are in rural areas and so on and so forth. But that's a, that is a program that we are actively involved in. It's certainly not what you're getting at about mandatory, um, mandatory service, public service, but uh, it, that is something that we do on an active basis to increase um, you know, the, the idea of becoming a great American citizen at a young age. Thank you. It would also require a substantial piece of legislation that would go through our Congress. Uh, I will tell you though that in, uh, from a standpoint that I just went through with the, the, F, uh, the FBI vetting through the confirmation process when I was last summer, and they're interviewing people throughout my neighborhood. And I saw every night I'm coming home, there's grand marquees in front of houses, and they're asking my neighbors about me. Within a couple of weeks, there were more American flags out in front of the house. And obviously, I made it through in the sympathy. FBI vetting. And, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so, but uh, the, point of that, the point of that story is people are busy and people are just trying to get through the day and they're, they're trying to get their kids through school and pay the bills and at times we get disconnected from the country. So I think that, you know, it's, it, does that make a lot of sense? Sure. Uh, and practicality be very hard to get through, but uh, there are measures that we're trying to look at how to stay closer to the country because we are truly the fabric, what, what brings out the best in the country, the U.S. Army. So thank you for your ideas. Ms. Cito? Mm -hmm. One is the, uh, school system. School system, okay. Yeah. So we are living in the Kaiserslautern area, and that has all services of the military there. And uh, the OD school there is awesome. And they get all the services intertwined, and they work wonderful with the kids. Um, I would say 90% of the community that lives there are satisfied with the school system there. That's great. That's good feedback, thanks. And we'll pass that along sure. to DOD senior leadership, but DOD school senior leadership. And the second one I'd like to um, um, ask or comment is daycare. Um, with that, we have a, quite a bit of a problem because, of, like I said, there's so many different services there, so there's a lot of large amount of soldiers. Mm -hmm. We have 18 to 24 months waiting list yeah. for people to get their daycares that keeps on in daycare on post. Hmm. And there's, in, in Germany, there's really no not daycare off So Gwen, so capacity or, or issue. A, Just the capacity for daycare, is that the yes, issue? Yes, there's not enough yeah. space. Do we have an average across, uh, thanks. Uh, do we have an average across, do we know what the stats are across the force on the average wait time on daycare? Do you, do you know the answer to that? Okay. okay. So let's take a look at Kaiser Slotten is what you said, right? Yeah. So 
Why don't you bring the why don't you guys bring the longer wait times to me and the secretary and let's uh, yeah. do some problem analysis here and see if we can one identify the problem and two come up with a solution to kind of reduce that in some way. It might be a so the issue of, like Secretary just said, capacity, mm -hmm. workers, uh, might be facility, might be a lot of things. So, yeah, Will do, Chief. You. Great. I love okay. getting homework for the staff. It's awesome. <laughs> Pile it on. One question here in the front. Sure. Uh, I'm Rory Cooper. I'm one of the civilian aides to the Secretary of the Army. And one of the, um, I'd like to know if there's a potential to grow the JROTC program. It seems like we have a higher density of JROTC programs. We are more successful in recruiting. Uh, we have a lower density, we have more challenges in recruiting. Yeah. And it's just an excellent way. It's also more access, if we have JROTC programs, right. like students, because mm -hmm. there's greater access for recruiters into those schools. Sergeant Major uh, Daly is deeply involved in junior ROTC yeah. programs, so I'm going to let him. It's a great question. Actually, it's uh, one of the most sought after programs from high schools around the country. And to be very frank with you, we have. I believe the last, when I left uh, TRADOC, because uh, that's who manages that program for us, I think there was well over a thousand schools in waiting. Um, we don't directly fund JRTC. It's funded from Congress through us, and we are the program facilitator. Um, but there is no limit if the school fully funds the program. Now, um, of course, it's an incentive when we fully fund the program or partially fund that. Um, but there is a waiting list, and it is that waiting list is based upon priority, and there's certain, there's certain metrics that we wait because um, when I travel around, I get a lot of people say, hey, Sergeant Major, you know, can you put a good name in for us to get a JRTC program? And I say, sir, unfortunately, I can't. There are certain things that govern that. Um, so one, um, there is no waiting list if you want to fully fund it from a school district perspective, but they would have to fully fund it from, from equipment to professors and all that. But there is a significant waiting list because of the funding restraints placed on it from co by Congress. So, Sergeant Major, just to give a feel mm -hmm. to the audience yeah. uh, in terms of fully funded junior ROTC program, can you give a sense of what we're talking about in terms of dollars? I, I don't know the specific. Okay. Is TRADOC, uh, someone from TRADOC in the so room? So is Gary Cheek floating around in here somewhere? I don't know if Gary's in here, but uh, someone someone on my staff here, if we can take a note, let, let's get an information paper out to the CASAs uh, on, uh, on uh, funding fund associated with junior RTC mm -hmm. and how we fully fund it and what mechanisms are out there in order for mm -hmm. local school districts to contact us. and Because it is a great program. I've seen it firsthand. And, Chicago and several other uh, cities, and this is really uh, a program that mm -hmm. I was surprised, I was amazed at the, at the uh, uh, degree of citizenry that you were talking about, sir, uh, and the program success rates in, in their college acceptance rates and joining the military and all kinds of other, you know, good things are happening with that program. So it's, wor it's a worthwhile program. So we'll get an information paper out to you and all the other CASAs. That'd be great. Okay, Mr. Seidel. Well, this is your year, so go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> One thing we run into when we do a lot of volunteering is uh, we have a chance to talk a lot. And one of the things that's come to light is social media. I see that we do really good from even the last couple of years where our PAOs are picking up, units have Facebook pages. But my question is there, can we look at like a social media surge? Because this is the way that our younger soldiers talk nowadays. Right. You have veteran-owned startup businesses. I mean, there's plenty of them out there. This is the way they talk to each other. You go to the DX, you see somebody wearing this brand of T-shirt or drinking this kind of coffee or something like that. Um, can we look at how our POs engage with it? I know there's OPSEC issues with it, of course. But uh, can we look at really... Because that's what You're talking about for family programs yeah. and information, pay, all, you know, information in general. Just right. put it out through social. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you're exactly right, and that is how this generation of digital natives communicates is through, uh, you know, calling dad and saying, "Mom, would you please read my text?" So I got it. Now we're all over it. Uh, RPAs. You're, you're very vigorous on social media, sir. Yeah. yeah well, he has a I'm, lot of help with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I wouldn't know where to begin. Me too. I, I get though. a lot of help. There's, I got a lot of fake people yeah. out there. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> just a plug, we have quite a few apps from MWR to MCOM, and I would just tell you that we, that we are. Um, we are quite, a, we have a huge presence on social media. We just need people to go out there and grab those things, and they're in your stores. You can find those, um, and they are, they are publicized. Um, but there's been a lot of work to be done. Well, you're talking about information dissemination. Dissemination, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the way to talk. No, that's right. Yeah. And, that's right. and I, think, I think we can uh, probably do better in a lot of information. Yeah. You know, here's what I found. For example, and, and I'm you know not a digital native, right? I'm a 
I don't know what the hell I am, but, but they, you know, when it comes to these things. But so I went to four different websites, and, I, and, and uh, it was amazing because I was, I was looking for something, right? And, and I won't even talk to websites or the forts or the bay or whatever. This was just recently, as the chief of staff of the Army. This was to prove a point because someone was pushing back saying, oh, no, no, we're squared away and we got all this stuff. I said, oh, really? Okay, so let's do this. Let's go to my office and we'll, let's do this. Boom, pull up one website, and there was this huge <coughs> link, and it was really obvious. I mean, anybody, you know, uh, who was even semi-conscious would have known, all right, Roger, I just do that, and then I go to the next link and I got my answer, right? Then I go to this other website. This is all the same service that we're trying to provide to soldiers at four different installations. I go to this other website, and the link is like in number eight print in the lower right, and, and you'd have to have like a telescope to see it. It was impossible to find it. And then it was like, so there wasn't any standardization. So the long and the short answer is we can do better to improve the methods, the tactics, techniques, and procedures of information dissemination within the Army. We can do a lot better at it. And we are not leveraging this new technology called social media to the maximum extent and to the level of uh, capability that that enables the system. We can flatten our information dissemination rapidly in the Army through good use of social media. A suggestion would be to integrate. Yeah, that's right. Between yeah. the EOs and the different services. That's right. Because that's the way that they get that's the right. information. You troll any internet. No, you're right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're right. So I promise to do better. But, <laughs> but no, seriously, we do have people actually looking at that to make it better. I mean, it's, you know, it's relatively new. I mean, this thing here, you know, that made billionaires in Silicon Valley, this thing's only been around since 2008. I mean, think of it. This is new technology. Uh, so we're coming to grips with it. We've got to learn how to use it. It's a great tool. It's got a downside and it's got an upside. Uh, and we've got to learn how to use it better than what we're using it right now. Beats the beeper. From Beats the beeper. Right. Beats the beeper. Okay. <laughs> two more questions here for Gwen Bingham. <laughs> All right. Ooh. There's Sorry. one. Miss mm-hmm. Mary. I guess. I'm involved in Guardian Angels Medical Service Dogs, and we pair veterans for uh, our veterans, uh, dogs come here, veterans with dogs uh, for PTSD, physical disabilities. We've seen a lot of dogs around uh, the facility over the last few days, and I'm thrilled to see that. Is there any consideration, since they're considered medical equipment, for some of our veterans that seriously need a dog to help facilitate the difficulties they have. Would there ever be any considerations from a financial standpoint that that's the military a, could yeah, no, facilitate that's a, that? It's very expensive. It is, and, and uh, but that's a great question, and uh, I don't know the answer, and I don't think Sergeant Major or Secretary McCarthy does, but Ron, do you have any information on that? If, if we don't, that's okay. I'd like to look into that. I think that's a great suggestion. Yeah, uh, does anybody, Diane or anybody, uh, Mike, anything on that? So that that's great. Uh, I just wrote that one down. That's, uh, I want to dig into that one. Uh, yes, it, there's a cost to it. I got it. Uh, but if some soldier out there uh, has done something for his country and requires a dog, I mean, come on. We're give me a break. For I, we'll get him a dog. We'll figure it out. Uh, and I, I'm sure there's 50 million reasons. Any lawyers in the room? Uh, I'm sure there's 50 million reasons why a lawyer will say no. But you've got to always remember with lawyers, one out of every two loses their case, right? So they're only batting 500. They're only batting 500. Uh, Do you realize we're in Washington, D.C., we're in a room and there's no lawyers? That's right. They're all lawyers. They're all lawyers. But uh, you know, you've got prosecution defense and someone has to lose. So they've only bat 500 at best, and uh, we, can, we can work around that, and we'll, we'll dig into that one. That's a good suggestion. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. One last question. Heidi Skelton Riley, Florida Army National Guard, on duty here at National Guard Bureau. As a dual service parent of five with children from preschool to high school, right now I can give you feedback on the education and sports piece. Great. Our now 14 year old son was going into fifth grade when we PCS to the National Capital Region a couple of years ago. Our children's involvement in youth sports, both on and off post in the community, as well as that military liaison at the school, thank you, um, have made a tremendous difference and an impact and contributed to the resilience of our family. One thing that I see an opportunity for us to do to reach out to that youth population for as potential recruits, increasing our end strength, is to 
brought in the teen resiliency program where even Fairfax County schools at this time are starting resilience training very similar to the Army program at the elementary level. This is a huge way to build the resilient skills in our youth population and also contribute to the PCS factor and our, our potential future recruits, sir. Great, thanks for that feedback, appreciate mm -hmm. it. Yes, sir. Okay, I think it's uh, 1630 and we're supposed to cut it off at 1630. So uh, Gwen, if you don't mind, we're gonna cut it off and I'd like to leave closing comments uh, to uh, Secretary McCarthy uh, to kind of close this out. If someone does have a burning question, uh, I'll, I'll we'll, we'll hang out of here for a few more minutes if you want to come up and give us a card or give us a point of contact or get our cards or whatever. We're happy to do all that. They can, uh, they and can, we can repeat Sergeant Major's phone number. That's what I say. They can text me. Yeah, you can text Sergeant <laughs> Major now that you have his phone number. It's on well, Facebook. Let's leave, the, uh, let's leave closing comments here uh, to Secretary McCarthy, and we wish you all the best, and thank you very much for your support to the Army and our families. Thanks, Chief. Yeah. Uh, you, re you recruit, uh, recruit a soldier and you retain a family. And uh, in large measure, it's our job to sp you get out and see, the u see units and you see uh, family readiness groups and continue to listen and to learn. And, uh, and it'd be my opportunity to act this fall. This will be really the first budget that I get to work on and, be, and, uh, and this one will be mine, so I own this one. And it's my job to work with Office of Secretary of Defense and the Congress to get the resources that we need for the Army. And I'm, we vow to do better. So thank you for your time. I learned a lot today. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Please join me in thanking all of our all senior right. leaders. Army strong. Well done, Gwen. Cool. We'd like to transition now to the recognition of our Army Survivor Advisory Working Group now at this time. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a special recognition coming up. If you can stay for just a few minutes more, we're, we want to recognize our Survivor Advisory Working Group and our Military Family of the Year. Just give us a few moments. On stage. On stage. So we're going to recognize members of our Survivor Advisory Working Group. The chief introduced them earlier. These survivor advisor advocates understand the challenges faced and the sacrifices made by our Army families as each one of them has lost a soldier, whether it be their child or their spouse. The Army Survivor Advisory Working Group embodies this sentiment by elevating survivor quality of life issues from the survivor community. Survivor advisors provide invaluable insight to the Army leadership. Their courage and resilience results in continued survivor benefit education and awareness improvements, which affect the quality of life for approximately 250,000 survivors. The advisors also champion enhancements to the casualty assistance officer and casualty notification officer training, which benefits not only our survivors, but those soldiers called upon to perform that vital mission. Today, we will honor the departing members of the Army Survivor Advisory Working Group who have set aside their personal losses and shared their perspective and experiences to improve survivor quality of life. Paul? Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated for the reading of the citations. Would Ms. Jennifer Laredo please come up on stage? Oh, I get it. So there's things on the thing that you read. <laughs> That's why we're moving around like peanut shells. Now I see it. Holly Ann, what's, oh, she's right here. That's for the big group. Oh, that's for a bigger group. That's different. <laughs>
The Secretary of the Army Public Service Award is presented to Ms. Jennifer Laredo for extraordinary service to the Army Survivor Advisory Working Group from July 2015 to October 2017. Ms. Laredo served with exemplary courage and resilience following her husband's death and provided an enlisted uniform survivor pers perspective to the team. A staunch survivor advocate, she provided critical support and connected with the uniformed survivors. Her experience, profound insight, and tenacity improved the quality of life now experienced by surviving soldiers and family members. Ms. Laredo's dedication, dedicated service to the nation is in keeping with the highest traditions of public service and reflects great credit upon her, the United States Army. Signed, Ryan D. McCarthy, Acting Secretary of the Army. Could we have Miss Amy Moore please come forward? <clears throat> the Secretary of the Army Public Service Award is presented to Miss Amy Moore for extraordinary service to the Army's Survivor Advisory Working Group from July 2015 to October 2017. Miss Moore displayed exceptional dedication as a champion of surviving children educational benefits while spearheading the United States Marine Corps Gunnery Sergeant John David Fry Scholarship. Ms. Moore provided invaluable support to her local Survivor Outreach Service Office. The critical knowledge she shared during the Casualty Assistance Officer and Casualty Notification Officer training contributed to surviving soldier and family members' quality of life improvements. Ms. Moore's dedicated service to the nation is in keeping with the highest tradition of public service and reflects great credit upon her and the United States Army. Signed, Ryan D. McCarthy, Acting Secretary of the Army. Also receiving the Secretary of the Army Public Service Awards are Miss Christy Robinson Russell, Miss Kristen Santos Silva and Mr. Philip Warman, who could not be here with the day. Let us also recognize them for their contributions and dedications. <laughs> At this time, I'd like to ask all of the Survivor Advisory Working Group members join us on the stage for a photo opportunity along with Ms. Millie and Ms. Daly. All right, great. While the, uh, survivor advising, while the Survivor Advisory Working Group members depart the stage, I'd like to ask the senior leaders, Ms. Millie and Ms. Daly, also to remain on the stage for the Family of Year presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you for doing such a great job of moderating the panel, General Bingham. And now is my, it is our um, time to recognize the AUSA Volunteer Family of the Year. With the Seidel family, please join us up on stage. I know. 
The AUSA Family of the Year Awards recognizes outstanding efforts to promote the well-being of soldiers and families and is presented to Sergeant First Class Aaron Seidel, an Army civilian and retiree, and his wife Anja, mother-in-law Mrs. Oshagel, and their three children, Marco, Zachary, and Annabella, although Marco could not be with us today, for their exceptional service to the Army, its soldiers, Army families, and their local community. Aaron helps with the planning, logistics, and labor of most of the events in the community. Mrs. O'Shagel has the backbone of all the events, contributing valuable planning ideas and organization. Her baking and German background are special touches. Marco assists with, with decoration, planning details, and execution. Zachary and Annabella routinely assist to ensure everyone is enjoying themselves. Anja works effortlessly to organize volunteers, tackle complex tasks, and deliver events to make the community more cohesive and proud. Through consistent volunteer work and a dedication to service, the Seidels have shown exemplary willingness to tirelessly help others. It is with sincere gratitude and appreciation that the AUSA Family Readiness Directorate presents this remarkable family with this token of appreciation. Can we have one more round of applause for the Seidel family? Thank you. I want to thank Secretary McCarthy, General Milley, and Sergeant Major of the Army Daly, Mr. and uh, Mrs. Daly, and also Mrs. Milley for uh, joining us for our annual town hall. How about another round of applause as they depart the stage? So this is the end of our 2017 Military Family Forum series. To our audience members, both in-house and online, thank you for your participation. To our senior spouses and distinguished guests, thank you for your support and encouragement. To the AUSA staff and Army staff that supported these forums, you are incredible and kept us on track and all on time. Thank you so much. Maranatha Bivens, thank you for posting on our Facebook page throughout the last two weeks and getting everyone excited about this year's forums. And Kevon Green, thank you for organizing all the goodies and handouts for our audience to enjoy. And he had a big hand in putting that basket together, so I thought he did a pretty good job. None of this planning happens in a vacuum. Thank you to the planning committee led by AXIM with assistance from MCOM, TRADOC, Force, FORCECOM, MEDCOM, and Army National Guard and Army Reserves, and other members of the Army staff. You truly are a team of teams. But most importantly, thank you, D. Guys, Larry Gilchrist, and Thea Green. You are truly the wind beneath my wings, and that is putting it mildly. It's been a great three forums. I'm so proud of all of the work that was put into it. Thank you all for joining us and being such great, great audience members, and we will see you all again next year. Bye.